you say that in passing so simply and in your world, it's obvious that those numbers are minor. You said it, silly as that sounds, 30, 40, $100 million deal. But how does the other person that's trying to figure out how to just grow the size of how they can see the opportunity or the world take on that same mentality and make what seem like very big numbers begin to start to shrink so that they can too attain some numbers like that someday? You got to have a plan. You got to look out next year, two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, know where you want to go in general, um, have some idea as to how you're going to get there with a full understanding that it's not going to be linear. You got to shuck and jive along the way. You got to use a lot of common sense and you got to hit a lot of singles. Got to hit a lot of singles to get someone around the bases. I love that. If you think you're going to hit a home run, once in a while you are going to hit a home run, but not too often. So you got to do it in bite-sized chunks and keep sticking to your plan and have good people around you. Got to have a good base. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a, a, a genuine treat today in the house, a, a very special guest, a part family, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, that's, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. I like that. I yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. I, hey, man, you were just at my wedding here at the beginning of the year, man. I mean, that's family, right? There that's, you go. That's family. And you know, sometimes in family, there's people that do some incredible things in their life. And fortunately, I've had probably just a few less than a handful of people in my family that have done some incredible things. But Bill, listen, you're a rock star in the business world, man. You've done some incredible things. And as I start to pick out some great questions to ask about all of that, I want to know what was the kickstart of this whole journey for you. So bring us back in time and start to take us down the journey of, of your pathway and start to educate us and familiarize us with some of your path and how it's unfolded and how it got you to the point that you're at today, my man. Well, that's a loaded question. But I know. I'm happy I, to be I just here, so. I'll fill you up real quick, man. I just want you to get after it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm happy to be here. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, it's pretty multifaceted, but I think the overriding for everything I've ever done is I just refuse to fail. Mm -hmm. And I failed a lot, by the way. So uh, the fear of failure has always driven me. And the feel of fear of uh, having to just rely on other people. Hmm. Uh, totally has always driven me. And I have a lot of people who, who work on my teams, but I've always wanted to do it on my own. And maybe it's the right way, maybe it's the wrong way, but uh, it's kind of worked out okay for me. So I think as a young kid, I've always been driven. I always worked. I always showed up, whether I was cleaning toilets or putting in windows or shoveling snow or working. I always tried to do the best I can do. And if you show up and you do a great job and you have a lot of luck, things can work out for you in all, in all sorts of facets of life, not just, not just business and personal relationships and family. You got to show up. Yeah. No question about that, man. So obviously when I hear that, I think the word luck stands out to me. Obviously, you are involved in very high level transactions, middle market at that, raising capital, mergers and acquisitions, and a severity of other things there that involved very high complex deals in the business world. But as you see it, because you said the word luck, what is that formula for you? I know I've heard it a lot. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, and because you said it, not just because I'm pulling it out of left field, the idea that luck happens because you show up every day, you do what's necessary moment to moment, you don't quit, is 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 that the luck you're talking about? Or is there some other recipe in there for the luck that you're referencing in there that makes it so that people hit it? Now, I want you to answer that, then I have a follow-up question to that, brother, so please take it from there. You have to create your own luck. I mean, there's a, definitely a factor of luck, but you have to work your friggin' ass off at all times. And you keep trying, you keep pounding away. Um, you got to be diligent at whatever you do. And same thing comes down to the people who you surround yourself with to help you create the opportunity. And if you work hard at something and you stick to it, uh, you'll have more opportunities to create your own version of luck. Uh, and sometimes there is true luck, just being at the right place at the right time. There's no question about that. But 
along the way, you're not going to be in that right place unless you're doing the right things along the way. Hmm. And you just can't do it alone. As much as I like being the, the, the serial entrepreneur, you got to have great people around you. You got to have people way smarter than, than you are who share the same vision and share the same values. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, if you don't have that, have those values, you're going nowhere. You got to have a moral compass as you do these things. At least that's how we operate. And you have to have a vision as to what you want to do. You really have to know where you want to go. And you have to look at the long game. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, today, a lot of people think it's just instantaneous. It should happen to me right away. That's just not how it works. I mean, we hire some folks sometimes who right away, they kind of think that uh, the senior guys should be working for them. Hmm. And almost anything you do in life, no matter where you went to school or what you learned, it's on the job training for everything. So you got to pay your dues and learn along the way. So there is no instantaneous gratification normally. Some guys hit it big. Yeah. It works out, but right. those are far and few between. Sure. Yeah, that, it's a great point. You know, there's there's a and I kid when I say this, but you got some gray whiskers on you, man. So I always value I always Hey, value. hey, hey. <laughs> I I have to pay to those today so I can see more seasons. <laughs> hey man, don't worry. I got the I got the pepper to your salt, man, if you know what I'm saying. There you, you go. You see, you see, I got the dark form of, of what you're working with. But I've always admired, I really, trust me, I was just thinking about this before I drove over here earlier, just chipping away, working at the house, working on some stuff for our clients. Um, I was thinking how much I value the the wisdom of the guy that's that's been around the block, right? And I get that there's the youngsters that they can come out of the gates and they're the anomalies or they're the once-in-a-lifetime unicorns, but you the guy that's been in the trenches for two, three, four, five decades type of thing. I've always appreciated that wisdom, man. I just, so I just wanted to, to, to share that vantage point with what you just said there. Um, but that's an interesting thing that you just said, because I think one of the most important things that anyone could do, um, especially at a younger age, is find a really good mentor or two who can guide them through various facets of life. Sometimes, um, folks are lucky enough to have that mentor in their mom or their dad. Mm. Um, most wow. often that is not the case right? because either they're not that person or you're just not going to listen to them. But if you can have a really good third party independent mentor or two who you can bounce things off of, who can keep you on track, who can challenge you appropriately and push you and who's there for the long haul for you. That's probably one of the most important things that, you know, anyone can have. And it's hmm. never too late to find a good mentor. I am, no, no, no. Listen, I know when we first met, I thought to myself, I said, man, this man can teach me some stuff. So, amen. I second that. The for, the for the people that are listening when it comes to that, because I've realized the value of how important that is, Bill, with the the finding the mentor thing. I've got several in my life. I'm very fortunate there. What do you look for when a mentor mentee relationship starts to become something or if somebody comes to you or how has it evolved for you when it comes to either your personal situation in terms of your younger looking for a mentor or somebody today comes to you and says, Hey, I want to get started. Uh, or I want to figure out how to get into the finance markets and figure this same game plan out that you are. Are you evaluating some criteria to, to filter the right people and how do you take a liking to somebody that is somebody that you'd be willing to invest your time to help them develop in their professional and personal lives? I think it's just one of those things that clicks almost instantaneously. Wow. When you feel a bond with a person and you really believe that they have something special about them or that they have a, a need that you can fill and that you want to be there guiding for them. And goes back to the same word I used before. Someone who has to share your values. Because if you're not aligned on your value systems going in, you're not going to click long term. Because being a mentor to someone is so much more than just business. Hmm. Very often it evolves around the business, but it quickly takes on a whole life of its own because life throws you a million curveballs. And you hopefully get to the point where the work part is kind of easy. It's hard work, but the work part is easy. 
um, it's those sorts of relationships that make it a lot more challenging, whether it's business relationships or personal. And navigating some of those things is really hard. Um, I think for the most part, even in the work I do, once again, hard friggin' work. Um, you have to work hard at it, but uh, I spend most of my time being a preacher, shrink, and rabbi. Mm. You know, just dealing with people at all right. sorts of levels. Folks senior, folks junior, uh, folks educated, folks not that educated, street smart people, ego and greed. You got to weigh all those factors trying to help people. So, you know, finding a mentor is really difficult, but I think for the most part, you have to find someone um, who you really have a strong um, bond to, um, affinity. Sure. And you know, look at someone who could be there for the long term for you. Being a mentor is not a one or two or three year thing. Right. It can be a 10 or 20 or 30 year thing. Do you recommend having a lot of them or categorizing no. them in, in each individual section of life? How do you how do you suggest that approach be taken? That is a great question. I don't think I've ever thought about it that way. Mm, yeah, there are probably certain people that you lean on different ways than others. Um, but a true mentor, you should be able to share everything with. Some people, you have to be cautious. You can't share some of your personal life or you can't share some of your business life. But a true mentor who is part of your ecosystem, you should be able to share everything with hmm. um, and be able to get some good insights. And ultimately, at some point in time, you know, as you grow into yourself or as one grows into, into their own self, um, there is value, there is mentorship that you can do upwardly to the other person as well, because everyone wants to learn. Right. I mean, one of the things that I love today is in our office, we have a lot of these young kids, as I call them, that could be 25, 35, even 40, um, you know, love having that energy around, mm, yeah, that true. vibe. It's yeah. just a great feeling, and they all have their value. I mean, some of these folks are super freaking smart, um, and they have different skill sets, but having that energy around is really empowering. That's incredible. Really yeah. empowering. And I'm imagining that a lot of talented young men or women, for that case, come to your doorstep and are like, hey, we want to work here. But to, hey, you got you to gotta fit the, the values, the principles of the company in order to earn your seat at the table. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like people have chips on their shoulders. Huh. Um, how do I phrase this appropriately? Uh, sorry to some of the folks out there who went to some of these schools, <laughs> which I also went to, by the way. Uh, Lisa, but uh, we do much better um, with folks who have gone to a state school or a secondary school. Mm. And they may have gone there because even though they got into the IBs or the top tier schools, their parents just didn't have the money. So they had no choice, even though they were fully qualified. Or they may have had a little bit too much fun in high school and they had to go to a state school or a secondary school. Um, but they come in, they come in hungry. They have a fire in their belly. They want to prove themselves. Those folks do really, really well in life. Now, you got to be smart. Right. That is just a given. Um, but you know, having that energy again, you have to bring it every single day. And it is it is it is hard. I mean, you hire some of these folks straight out of school. You know, they don't realize they, have to, they actually have to get up every day at 7 a.m., and things actually work happens in the evenings and work happens on weekends because you can't choreograph a lot of the stuff, mm. at least not in an entrepreneurial environment. Sure. Um, if you have a nine to five job, um, which is great for a lot of people, um, you're already built into a box. Sure. You're built into a box. That box will expand some, but it's not to expand in a explosive way that is the just American dream. And you look at where, you know, every, you know, almost all of us, you know, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, they came from Europe. They came from Asia. I mean, they look to come into this country as just a golden ticket. Um, you know, exactly and most foreigners about. still, most, most foreigners still do look at that today. I have no idea how so many people in this country, um, may I curse it not on this? Yeah, of course, man. Yeah. Let it fly. I mean, I have no idea. So many Americans shit on the opportunity here. 
I mean, we have it so good. We have freedom. We have laws. If you want to work your ass off here, you can do anything you want yeah. still. Spot on, man. We just had this conversation recently with a mentor of mine about uh, not getting into anything politics wise, but a a fact of life that the American dream is still what makes this place great. And there are and have been uh, evidences of them, them trying to kill the American dream so people can get their movements going in certain directions. But that's a whole nother conversation. Bill, I have a question for you because you mentioned something about these folks having chips on their shoulders. What was the chip on your shoulder along the way, early on, middle of the way, making some success progress, starting to see some results, and then next level running a heck of a company now. How many people do you have working for you now? 25, 30. 25, 30. Small little organization. Managing director, but doing middle market transactions and the hundreds of millions worth of dollars, if not billions. That's no, that's no easy feat. So the chip on the shoulder for you was what? And how did you keep maintaining that to keep evolving yourself and your business to get to the point that you're at today? When I was young, 10 and 12, I wanted to be totally independent, financially independent, because I saw a whole bunch of ups and downs in my family. And I never wanted to be in that position. So I was the guy cleaning out garages. I had a little home maintenance company. I've cleaned more toilets than most maids have ever cleaned in their life. Um, I have done more trashy housework and low level jobs, but you know what? It built me. And I had a lot of fun in high school and probably not the best grade. So I went to an okay school. And when I went to that school, I said, I'm going to do the best I can. And I graduated first in my class and, and I focused, I focused and I didn't have a lot of fun the first couple of years in college, mm. uh, but I knew what I wanted to do and I knew where I wanted to be. You know, and that allowed me to go to wall street and do some good work. It allowed me to go to a really good grad school, and it just allowed me the opportunity to do what I wanted to do. And it wasn't just linear, by the way. Even throughout that, there are ups and downs and deals and jobs and everything else. But you you have to focus. You can't look back. And when you have kids and you have a wife and you have all these things, um, you have to keep going because failure is not an option. And just that hard work and perseverance and treating people the right way along the way. Uh, you know, hopefully you get lucky and things work out either well or really well. I feel blessed and I still love what I do. I mean, sure. I'm jazz every day doing this because I view what we do as changing people's lives. Sure. Anybody can, anybody can do a $2 billion deal of Goldman Sachs. It's not that hard, relatively speaking, but to do a small 20, 30, 40, $100 million deal, as silly as those numbers sound, it really is an art. And we change people's lives. We change families' lives. And I'm really proud of how we do that for them. I got to jump in right there because you say that in passing so simply. And in your world, it's obvious that those numbers are minor. You said, as silly as that sounds, 30, 40, $100 million deal. How... How does the person that's in the space of trying to elevate their mentality or their financial blueprint or the thing that that's holding them back to that? Because it, it was so subtle how you said it, and I get it because you're doing deals at such a much bigger level than that. And so you're referencing it in such a small size, but that's a gift almost. And I'm sure from experience and having been in those worlds and, and, compiling and putting those deals through the pipeline and executing those deals obviously gives you reference to say, those are actually small deals. But how does the other person that's trying to figure out how to just grow the size of how they can see the opportunity or the world take on that same mentality and make what seem like very big numbers begin to start to shrink so that they can too attain some numbers like that someday? You got to have a plan. You got to look out next year, two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, know where you want to go in general, um, have some idea as to how you're going to get there with a full understanding that it's not going to be linear. 
You got to shuck and jive along the way. You got to use a lot of common sense and you got to hit a lot of singles. Got to mm-hmm. hit a lot of singles to get someone around the bases. I love that. If you think you're going to hit a home run, every once in a while you are going to hit a home run, but not too often. So you got to do it in bite sized chunks and keep sticking to your plan and have good people around you. Got to have a good base. Mm. And um, you, I think it's important to take risks, to take qualified risks and qualified chances in order to get the opportunity that you want. That opportunity is different for every individual. So what is right for me or right for you is not right for her, it's not right for him. Everyone has to find their own sort of plan. But you have to know where you want to go and then you have to get a, you have to set up a plan to try and get there. And you have to be astute enough to know that within that plan, you have to adapt along the way. Is that customary for most entrepreneurs in terms of the journey that you see them going down? I get it. Look, I'm obviously a fan of the plan. I also realize plans backfire because once you get into the actual combat, <laughs> lots of stuff is happening, right? Market forces, competition forces, internal forces. There's so many different forces that start to beat each other up. In that process there, how would you describe the entrepreneurial stages, one would say, right? So obviously I remember you just saying, hey, high school, you got clear on what you wanted. You you knew what you wanted to do. That took you to Wall Street. And then there in Wall Street, you probably got more focused but then at that point, you're, um, and maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, you're taking on a job in Wall Street to start off with? and I had a regular job just like everybody else. Okay, okay. So talk but, to me about how that journey as a guy that has a job but still knows he wants financial freedom and not to have to ever think about having to be worried or concerned about the money, it starts to translate into this ascension and this graduation of lots of different endeavors and now you start to run your own firm and all these different evolutions along the way. I'm very curious how you would dissect that. It's all about learning. I mean, in your twenties or early thirties, wherever that is, you need to be a sponge. You need to pay your dues and soak up as much information and learn as much as you can about your trade and what it is. It doesn't have to be a high powered white collar job. It can be a great, work level, blue collar, or anything in the middle, a service job. But if you're going to be a trash man, be the best friggin' trash man out there because one day you may figure out a path how to do something different with that Hmm. and to the like recycling business or anything else around it. So everyone's learning curve is different, but, you know, coming out of school, you really don't know anything. You've gotten some education, which is highly diluted in my opinion these days anyway. So, you have to learn a skill. You have to learn a trade. You got to get the education around it such that when you feel it is the right time to go out and do something on your own, do it with a bunch of guys, join a startup and take some of those risks that you have the basis and you have the confidence of, hey, I can really add value to some other people doing this. I've done this well for other for other people. Either I can do that on my own or I've done this well for other people and then I'm going to try something different because I have some other idea or some ideas that I can take this and I can parlay this along the way. And if you do it the right way, in that first phase, you've met a lot of people who are going to be your cheerleaders. If you do a great job for for folks, they will actually appreciate and understand that, hey, it's time for her to go out and spread her wings and do her thing. And I'm going to cheerlead them. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to give them seed capital or... I will give them some co-investment because, you know, she is really talented and I want her to really go out and do really good things. Some of the things I'm happiest about are, you know, some of the folks who have left working for me or working for us, you know, who are now literally, you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies who have gone out to start their own other investment banks. There's plenty of opportunity in business for everyone. So when someone leaves, I'm not concerned about them hurting our business. I know how hard it is anyway. You know, I want to cheerlead good people to go out and do really good things. Yeah. No, oh, that's fantastic. Can you, um, for the people, for the dummies, there are some dummies. I always take a dummies position, by the way, because I don't know anything and I always want to keep learning. I'm the biggest dummy out there, by the way. Okay. You actually just hit on something really interesting. 
The older I get, the less I know. <laughs> It's almost like a, reverse, it's like a reversal, huh? So the younger you are, the everything you know, and then the older you get to realize you don't know a damn thing, right? When I was early 20s or something, I was so freaking smart. Uh, I was probably a quasi-asshole too. <laughs> but now, you know, I know what I don't know, which is I don't know very much. Yep. And it's great to have good people around you. And I love learning every single day. Yep. You have to have that learning culture and that learning environment. That's so true. So it's why the name of the show is always on the grow. It references, hey, listen, it's a there you go. Const Look at that. Right. constant and never-ending pursuit of figuring out how to grow mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything. It's just learning, right? It's a form of learning, one would say. Um, in the investment banking world, talk to me as a dummy. That is a, hey, we find companies, we help them do A, B, C, and D. And for the entrepreneurs out there that are listening right now that have these hopes, these dreams of, of uh, one day interacting or working with an investment banker, that's a good thing, obviously, because that means that something good is about to take place. Company's going to go public, a sales going to company, uh, it's going to be acquired or s something along those lines, correct? In most cases, you yeah. got it. Okay, yep. so so what what so give me an example of what I'm not getting right there. So start to just take us down a path maybe an entrepreneur would find valuable, and the power and the utilization of an investment bank and what you guys do and all those great things. Yeah, if someone started up um, a company because they have a passion, I believe that uh, unless you have a really phenomenal idea, if you have a passion for something and you want to work hard doing it, you will do. Pretty well, really well, or super phenomenal. So you got to have a passion for you. But as someone is out there building up, building out their business, I'm a firm believer in looking way out there. Where do I want to be and what do I want to do? At the end of the day, you can build a business and you can just transition your kids and your family in, which is a great thing. But at the same time, you may need help along the way getting there or even bringing your family in because, um, you don't want to end up as some 60 or 70 year old person with a very valuable business, but not some money in the bank. So somehow your kids are going to have to fund buying you out. Um, a large part of our role is I will watch companies and advise companies on the side for, you know, free, um, helping them get from a modest sized company to a middle market company to a larger company where at some point, Either they are thinking about, hey, I should be selling all or part of this business. Um, or as often as the case, the entrepreneur can do so much. Going from a million dollars to $5 million of revenue, let's, let's use the term as easy. Going from five to 10 is a heck of a lot harder. Going from 10 to 25 or 30 is much harder. Mm -hmm. 30 to, so you can just do it out, it gets much harder. But at some point, the entrepreneur may outgrow their own their own skill set or may outgrow their own risk profile and say, I want to take some chips off the table and I want to bring in a venture capital fund or a private equity fund or a large partner to help me take this from my $60 million company to a $600 million company. Because there are private equity funds, which are just large investment groups or venture capital shops who are much more skilled mm. at taking a business from X up to Y. And along the way, the value of that pie grows and everyone wins. So it's not just selling your business. But for the most part, what we do is we we sell privately held companies. And along the way, we will give counsel to those companies so that we can help them grow and get to the point that they need to get to. Sometimes we have to raise money for them so that they can expand their businesses. Um, and not all things are linear, by the way. Sometimes a lot of these companies hit a landmine, a pothole, a speed bump, COVID. Right. Um, things just happen whereby um, some of the investment banking is not positive stuff. It's what do we do to fix this? Sometimes you have to shed an arm or shed a leg in order to save the body. And we do that as well. Um, you know, what What we do is more art than it is science. Yeah. Um, and it depends on the business, the service line, the people involved, what the expectations are. But uh, once again, circle back to where you were. When you're, when you're looking at a business, lots of business owners 
you know, start the business and they think I'm just going to do this, but you should really have a focus of, you know, here's my aim. If I can get my business from a million dollars to $20 million, I think I will be a big success. And sometimes one of the biggest challenges that we actually see is entrepreneurs are not thinking big enough. When you, when, it, when, when an entrepreneur starts a business, they put their money into the business they big borrow and stolen to get it going. Um, they don't make any money the first year, perhaps, or two. Suddenly, they're making $50,000, $100,000. They go, hey, that's not bad. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, they're making $250,000, then $500,000. Like, I've never made $500,000 in my life. Right. And they stop taking risks mm. when folks will look at the business and say, oh, my God, you have a... Pick your number. You have a $10 million business. You're making $500,000, a million dollars. Your $10 million business should be a $200 million business. But that entrepreneur says, I'm making half a million or a million dollars a year. I never made this much money in my life. I'm that dumb and happy, or I don't want to take the risks to get it to that level. So they may need a jump start. They may need to bring in a partner or partners to do that. So there are plenty of opportunities out there, um, but everyone's mindset is different. Everyone's mindset is different. That's a, a very relevant and recent last bit of wisdom you just shared there because I was talking to somebody the other day about something similar where, you know, even for us, like when, when our business right now, you start making some money and then like you just said it exactly. I was, I think I was sharing this with Katie. I was like, you know, you make this money and you're like, look at this money we're making right now. And then you think about growth and you're like, well, I got to start using this money for growth. So we're not going to have the money that we have right now that we're looking at. That looks exciting. That looks tantalizing because we're going to have to go back and continue to reinvest the money into the growth of the business. And it's that, it's that crossroads that you face as an entrepreneur where what can you stomach and how far can you keep pushing that, sacrificing the today for the tomorrow or for the two-year, five-year, 10-year thing where you, I heard this once, it's almost like you eat shit for five years so you can eat caviar for the rest of your life type of thing. <laughs> and it's fascinating that you say okay. that. Yeah, yeah, I heard that years ago. I said, well, that's a pretty yeah. good thing. Eat shit for some years so you can eat caviar for the rest of your life. That's pretty good. I think it was Gary Vee that said it actually. I think that's who it was, if I remember correctly. So to your point, it makes a lot of sense. Now, let me ask you this, Bill, with, with regard to the entrepreneur that you mentioned there at the different stages, at the, at the levels of hard, because you mentioned, you know, uh, one to five million is tough, five to 10 to 20 to, to 50 to 100 million, 200 million. What do you notice as the main faults or the main points of decline when each one of those different levels of entrepreneur either makes it through and goes to the next level or fails. And I'm not saying fails in terms of, I know entrepreneurs fail, but like they get stuck. They hit a peak and then they don't evolve anymore. What are some of your insights there and maybe some opportunities for the listeners to see, Hey, you know, if you just did X, then Y would happen. If you just did Y, then Z would happen, but don't do A, B and C because that's not going to help you out anywhere. What would you say to that? I think folks get somewhat complacent Mm. as they get into different parts of their own personal life cycle. So I think life cycle has a lot to do with it. And, you know, you know this well with family now. It's fascinating. Uh, Yeah, you're so right. It's when you're whatever, 25, 30, 35 and single, and you only have to worry about yourself, your mindset is different than, um, I'm sorry if I'm being a little bit sexist, ladies and gentlemen here, uh, but that's just the way hey, I think about it. I hit it, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I still think it's a responsibility to take care of your family. Yep. And you think a little bit differently. Um, just put it this way. When you are 25 or 30, you know, to go and jump out of a plane and parachute and do all that fun stuff, not a big deal. When you have a little one at home, you're going to think about that. Mm. Or your wife's going to say, hey, you're doing, or if your wife's jumping out of a plane because it goes both ways, you're going to say, 
hey, honey, uh, are you sure this is a good idea? It was probably a great idea when she was 26 years old hopping out of a plane. Right. But when she's, you know, 30, 35 years old hopping out of a plane, it's a little bit different. So I think it's a complacency sometimes. It's a lifestyle issue. And mm, perhaps it's just... Maybe it's just a risk tolerance. Right. Um, I just, I mean, I love entrepreneurs. And right. there are so many types of entrepreneurs. But there is no one type of entrepreneur out there. So I mean, that's, that's what the beautiful thing about this country is. And, uh, and you can be an entrepreneur in larger companies, too, if you have the right sort of structure and the right sort of flexibility. But you also want to have the compensation system aligned. In a true entrepreneurial business, if you're getting compensated appropriately, terrific. Um, can some corporate structures handle that and reward it? Absolutely, but probably not as great um, as a true entrepreneurial business. But then you have a lot of startup companies. You have a lot of companies. You get your stock options. You grow the business. The company goes public. You can do far better than anywhere else. So, you know, just to, it's not just being your own your own boss. You can create a lot of value and have a lot of fun along the way uh, by being in some other sorts, of, some other types of organizations. It just doesn't have to be your own sort of business. Sure. Um, but I think you got to have fun along the way, by the way. Yeah. yeah and yeah, totally. Um, it's easier to say you're having fun when you're, you know, older as well. But um, I do think that the younger generation um, sometimes they have a little bit too much work-life balance for my liking, but. There is this is a this is a judgment free zone, except when it's my own company. Uh, but you know, I think having fun along the way is really important. Because life throws you a lot of curveballs. Sure, sure. When you say work life balance, are you talking about there is a difference between what you were raised on and the value and the principle of working late nights, getting up early mornings, little to no sleep, and grinding and getting after it. And then today, are you saying that the younger, newer generation is saying, ah, oh, I want to feel good and I want to take breaks and I want to go on vacations and I want to just chill out for a month or two or three or the whole half of the year and then maybe I'll come back and work? Is that kind of the idea? All, those, all, those, all those things are true. Okay. Um, grinding, just for the sake of grinding, is a waste of everyone's time. Face time in the office is a waste of time. But there's no shortage of value added things that anyone could do. So striking the proper balance. Mm -hmm. And if you want to create something, whether you're creating it for yourself, creating it for the firm you're with, even if it's a large, large company, it is just hard work. Most of what people do it really is not is. that hard if you're actually decent at it or good at it. It's just hard work. And in my opinion, you absolutely, no matter what you do, you have to outwork the other guy. Hmm. You have to outwork the other guy. Um, and that's just part of the process. But I do think that to some extent, the younger generation has a right with some of this work, some of this work life balance to really, to really get there. But, you know, I've had these examples where you know, I've asked people directly who work for us. If I gave you 120% of the comp for what I consider 100% of the effort or 80% of the comp for 80, they would actually take the lower number because they want they want the freedom of time. Mm. Um, and I don't think in most cases that's going to get people to where they want to be. I mean, this could be the first generation where the younger generation does not do as well as their parents. I mean, it's been a rising tide for, I don't know, I have, I have no idea, 100 years more? Yeah, yeah. Quite this could be time. the first generation where overall folks don't do as well. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a forecaster. I'm not a talking head, so I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I say you, have a little, you, you know quite a bit, though. That's just my <laughs> view. What do I know? <laughs> but you got a damn good viewpoint, man. You've done some great things very successfully. Uh, so I just, can't, can't, can't I just got that. lucky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just got lucky. Why don't you share with us what one of those lucky stories were then, man, if you're so lucky? Why don't you, in, in, unless you, you can't access it on demand and you got to think about it for a second. I, I put you on the spot a little bit there. 
Or otherwise, uh, I, I can detour here and I can find some other great paths to go down too. You know what? In my in my case, you know, probably one of the luckiest things that happened to me. It wasn't so lucky at the time, but we had a really nice. Prior to starting my own investment bank, I had uh, I had a couple of nice equity hits, meaning I made some money um, being involved with some companies that we sold. So I got a little, little bit of a taste of equity, and I got involved in a in a company that grew like a weed and we were high flying and we went public. And, uh, and as I say, on paper, we were actually wealthy. So we had a lot of wallpaper. Wallpaper means that when your stock goes bust or something bad happens, you end up with uh, a lot of nice wallpaper because it's not worth much. But we ended up doing okay. Not as great as we would have liked. And, um, you know, sold off the company, some arms and legs and, you know, here I was, uh, probably in mid thirties or something. Wow. Guy, c- couple of, couple of kids. I took six months off. I was bored. So I said, I just had to do something, but having that experience gave me the opportunity then to say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what I like to do. So, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. The best thing I ever did was truly start my own company because huh. it has allowed me to get to where I am today. Sure. Um, you know, if I'm ever going to bet on anyone, I'm going to bet on me. Hey, man, come on now. You speak of Vegas, gonna, language, which gets, gets me excited. Oh, uh, uh, well, but that that is, that is not that is not for everyone, by the way. Um, there are people in just different just just different roles. I've not had a paycheck in over 25 years. What do you mean by I've that? Had, so, so I, can you explain what that means when you say I haven't had so so? It's, well, someone who works for someone else gets a paycheck. Right. Okay. Got it. Clear. But do they yeah. make fifty thousand dollars a year or three hundred thousand dollars a year? Someone's writing them a check every sure. week. Sure. Got it. And they have W two income. I mean, I haven't seen a paycheck in twenty five years, um, and that's a risk that I was willing to take because I had confidence in me. And if I was going to fail, I was going to fail because of me, mm-hmm. and I was not going to fail. I love that last part. I was not going to fail. I don't think enough people understand that. Can you explain to me how you got into the jet stream with those two companies, one that was uh, uh, favorable to you in the equity position and then one that went public, which, by the way, you said you made a lot of money on, right? Is that the is that in your mid-30s? No, I had a lot of wallpaper, meaning we actually did okay. At one point, we were worth – we had some wealth. But at the end of the day, the – Stock didn't do all that well. Okay. So, as I said, we had a lot of wallpaper, meaning you had a lot of stock certificates back in the I day okay, that you could put on your wall because that was the only thing that was worth wallpaper. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. How how did you position yourself to get involved in those deals at that time in your earlier 30s? What was the strategy there? Um, at those times, I had, I'd worked for a couple of really big organizations, and I got the training I talked about for – I don't remember five or seven, eight years, maybe. Okay. Um, so I went to a much smaller, high growth, privately held company that I was able to get a chunk of equity in. A um, bunch of really entrepreneurial young guys and gals, and we built up a sizable national business. So you know, I was part of the team that did that. I did not found that company. That was someone else's idea. Um, it was ready it already had some venture capital in there but uh, i was part of the team that came in raised a bunch more money grew the business into a national footprint so it was a lot of fun doing it and you know so i kind of eased more into into the entrepreneurial thing i didn't just jump right in so i got my first taste of it that way fascinating Um, very yeah there's no one way in everybody does it everybody does it does it differently and you know there are lots of folks who do it kind of the old the old fashioned way. Um, they may be involved in a family business that's gotten to a certain level and has done very nicely for that family for twenty or thirty years. And that younger generation comes in and they have the energy and they can take that small to modest sized company and just do phenomenal things with it. Mm-hmm. I mean that is risky as well. That's high energy. But, uh, you know, there are lots of businesses that have grown that way. 
Sure. And, and that second generation has normally seen how the first generation struggled to get it there. So they come up with the understanding of how hard it was. The issue is that third generation sometimes um, believes that they were, that everyone's always been wealthy. Mm. And that's not just how it works. I mean, when, you know, we first had our company, we were in, I don't even know if we were in 1200 square feet and we needed an extra office. So we actually cut, we actually cut a hole through the wall to get into one of the other offices to make it easy to get in. You know, we would sit there and say, Hey, should we spend $250 on a Southwest flight to go and pitch this piece of business? Is it really worth it? Now we're at a whole different level of, you know, how we just get around, but small businesses all start out the same way. They're mm. all bootstrapped. They're all bootstrapped. And it's that, it's that mentality that you somewhat need to keep as you grow your business. You always need to be hungry. I'm glad I you kind of say that. every year on January one, we are back to zero and I'm paranoid that, Oh my God, what sort of year is it going to be? Interesting. And knock on wood, most times the, the following year is better than last year. Sure. Sure. Can you expand on that idea about all small businesses start the same and more of a reference point for you, Bill, where, what were you doing when you first started your company? Were you out? And here's my philosophy, by the way, and I really believe this. I actually, I don't think there's any other substitute for this, but the first doorway gateway that you have to go through when you start a business is sales. You can't fucking get anywhere if you don't sell something. Would you disagree with that or would you agree with that? 100% revenue cures okay. all else. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm imagining your first, your first months, year, whatever that was when you started your business was all, how do we get customers? That's, I mean, that is the most important thing in most businesses. How do you, how do you get your customers and how do you service the heck out of them? So you do a good job. So you get more customers. Yep. And along the way, we were all checking out the trash too. Hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. So you do everything in a small company, mm -hmm. but yeah, but you know, today we are much more focused, but there is not a thing that most entrepreneurs cannot do in their business. If they have a factory, most cases they know how to work that machine a certain way, or they know how to do the books because that's just what the, that's just what the entrepreneur is. So, you know, I love seeing guys who run these businesses. They have really nice sized companies right now, but they understand everything going on on the floor, everything out in the field, not to the same level that they used to, but you really need to understand your business well so you can oversee your business mm. because the smallest thing in a small business can send you down the wrong set of rabbit hole and it's hard to get out of. Sure. So, so it's, I'm, uh, is, it's is, attention is, to detail. Right, right. So in your case, was that you or did you have partners? Because I know that sometimes people can take on all of those onuses themselves. Sometimes they're part of a group of two or three or four or five sometimes where each is, you know, respectfully doing their duty in that category. How, how does, you know, and again, that's probably a personality thing. One might be way more of a wizard than the other. Um, I'm sure you've seen some different contexts there too, right? How was it for you guys? Um, I currently have two other partners but we all have the same vision of values. Um, and we, we all at the outset were pulling on the oars because it was up to all of us to make this thing work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and knock on wood, almost from day one, it really, really actually worked for us. And yes, we had some ups and downs, uh, but we all came in with really good experience and really good work ethic. And we trusted each other and, you know, having people to share that pain with along the way is pretty important because when you really talk to, when you talk to most entrepreneurs, um, there aren't people in their own organizations who they can really lean on as they're getting going. And the story is, you know, the entrepreneur makes a choice. He walks out to his car, he looks in the mirror and says, fuck, I sure hope I made the right decision because who's he going to talk to? I mean, it's hard. Yeah. It is really hard, but if you want to reap those rewards, and those rewards just don't have to be economic. Some people just like the independence. Mm -hmm. They just like the independence. They want to do their own thing, 
And if they make the economics, then they're actually happy. Somebody once told me that uh, entrepreneurs are the craziest ones out there because they're willing to give up uh, nine to five, 40 hours a week or whatever that number is to trade up for 80, 90, 100 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I work just as hard. I mean, today that I did 25, 30 years ago. What I still, don't mind it. What still drives you then? Obviously, you've made the money. You've got all the success on that side. You've done the biggest deals. I'm What's, having so much fun right now. Yeah. I'm having more fun than I've ever had. I don't have any pressure. Mm. I don't have any pressure. So I don't, I don't have... I don't have the economic pressure, so I can just have fun. We can be very choosy. And a large part of what drives me today is to train and guide our younger guys and gals so that we can build a business that they can leverage into. Mm -hmm. um, I wish when I was 25, 30, 35, I had the opportunity that our younger folks have today because it is a limit. Wow. It is limitless. And, you know, I want to continue to build this thing so that they can take this and run with it. Um, you know, I also want to stay active. Uh, do I want to work this way forever? Absolutely not. But do I want to be involved in the game? Does it stroke my ego? Absolutely. Um, and it's all about long term relationships. Um, and you know, I've built up great sorts of relationships. So, I can do this for uh, you know a lot more, lot more years, um, and it's fun and help these guys build this thing out in the way that they want to build it out. Do you think? Do you think that? Because I keep you know your reference point is very familiar for a lot of people that I have discussed their success paths and why they won and why they are continuing to win. The fun in the game part, is there a period in there in the entrepreneurial journey, Bill, that the entrepreneur themselves, and, and I've heard this in other directions too, where you might have to do things that suck and that you don't like and that you're not good at as well, and it's not as fun as it sounds today, but then maybe there's a turning point in there at some point down the road where it starts to get more fun because now you don't have the pressure like you just said you don't have because you've made it terms of, you know, that's relative. So your made it is, is what you make of it. But do you understand where I'm going? Where it's like, there are people out there that say, and it sucks, like it's not fun, but they're still in it because they want the big picture. They want the outcome of what the future looks like. Well, don't get me wrong. There's still a lot of stuff that I and the senior folks do every day that shit work. So many, every job has so much shit work that you have to do. Mm. But you got to do the shit work to be able to do the fun, high quality, sexy stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. No one's just doing sexy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's just stuff you got to do. You got to do the blocking and tackling. And we all still do it every single day. So we just delude ourselves that everything's fun. Sure. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, you, 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 you create a movie in your mind, huh? You got this whole different screenplay that's rolling for you. I'm a legend of my own mind because I'm the only one who matters. I'm like, I'm the best singer in the house when I'm there alone and I'm so in death. Oh, that's fantastic. Someone's going to like that quote later when she hears this. Yeah, you know what? We're, we're, yeah. Yep. Yep. I was going to say there's a lot more people that are going to get that quote that they like too, because we're going to, we're going to actually extrapolate that yeah. out and, and have it as a standalone there too. So that'll be good. Amen. There you uh, go. You look, <laughs> you going to say something? No, no, I was just coughing. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you know, for, for purposes of not keeping you all day, because I, I could, and we can have a great conversation. I, I got plenty of energy. Man, I got good. stuff to do after this interview. I'm going to go do calls, so it's all good. <laughs> Look at that. By the way, would you enlighten us with what you're going to be talking about on those calls? Because calls still work, ladies and gentlemen. People forget that the phone is one of the greatest assets and tools. Oh, my God. You're going to take me on my soapbox. Dude, let's go. People hide behind emails or texts. Pick up the friggin' phone and call someone. See, if you want to, if you want to leave me a message, then follow up with a text or email. Hey, I just left you a voicemail. Please listen to it. Pick up the friggin' phone. Isn't it amazing? Uh, pick up the phone. Oh my God. It drives me nuts. Now from your drives vantage point, is it somebody, is it your company, the people in your company that that's happening or people that are calling or trying yes, to get in you touch? guys watch this? Yes. You guys know what I always say. <laughs> pick up the phone. 
<laughs> so I'm not good. telling them anything that they don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've heard a million times. I love it. Yeah. Hey, folks, the phone works. It's by the way, it's 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 a it's a guaranteed formula once you get good at it. it it's there's no there's there's no absence of possibility when you start picking up the phone. We're very heavy on the phone on our side too. Trust me. And there's no substitute for meeting people in person still. <sighs> Spot on. I mean, the Zoom is great. Mm -hmm. It works. And we use it a lot more than I ever thought it would work. But you got to show up in person. Yeah. Amen. I mean, you have to look someone in the eye. Um, I will I will travel cross country for a 20 minute meeting to look someone in the eye to see, do I like him? Do I trust him? Can I do business with him? Mm. Got to look him in the eye. That's a powerful point. That's a powerful point. You know why that's powerful? Because the other night I had some clients in town for all of the work that we're doing. And we had a big conference here. And, and, and I had four of my clients actually sitting with me at the same time. And then they had several of their other colleagues, peers, and friends that were all as part of the same industry. And it was just that bond that we had there in that moment that the ones that I hadn't met yet um, were connecting with me in person. And I know that's actually a superpower of mine. So I'm so glad you said that <laughs> because when, when I get, it's almost like, you know, you know, that guy or that gal back in high school, they man like, Hey, when I, when I smile at that girl, that guy, they know it's, it's on, baby. It's I've got them in my camp. I feel that same way when I meet somebody in person. <laughs> that's a side note, man. Anyway, Bill, I want to know before we get out of here, man, cause, cause, because we, we do have to wrap up here shortly. <sighs> Talk to me about your negotiating style. How do you bring a great position to a deal or how do you how do you take those steps in a maybe a big transaction you're dealing with the maybe the company you're looking to get sold or acquire or partner with or advise or maybe it's it's the one that you're trying to the company you're working with trying to sell it to uh, whoever the acquirer or the the outsider might be in that circumstance what's sort of your philosophy on the negotiation thing be a really good listener hmm and not just listen, but hear and try and understand what they have to say. Um, and think about everything you do from the other side. If I was in their shoes, how would I be looking at this? What would I want? What would I need to do? What do I need to get? How is the other side trying to achieve what they want? And 